So I haven't made one of these tutorial slash guide videos in quite a while, and I do apologise for that. Whilst I was taking my break, however, quite a few people were asking me, could you make a H3X guide, or can you share some more information about it, or some more kind of tips and tricks and stuff like that? And so that's what this video is. This really, really long video is going to be my guide to the Panasonic H3X 200 and the HPX 170, which I'm shooting on right now. Now, because the 170 is very similar to the 150, a lot of the information I share regarding the HPX 170 also relates to the HMC 150. So it's going to be in the title, I don't own a HMC, but again, they're pretty much the same camera. The menus look different and they record to a different codec or a different format. That's realistically the main differences. I already know that there is a HVX200 guide out there by a guy called Jacob Sawyer, I believe. I might be getting your name wrong, I do apologise. Really good guide, I thought. Really good guide. Lots of good information, very useful. There are some things, however, that I feel like I could add to that and just some things that I've picked up as well. So I'm going to leave a link to his guide as well, because there may be some things that I forget to add or he might do differently, so it'd be good to have those two different opinions. So. Like I said, this is going to be a guide on the HVX200 and on the HVX170. So because I know this video is going to be pretty damn long, like I don't even know how long it's going to be right now, it could be an hour, hour and a half, two hours, who knows. I will be leaving timestamps in the description if you need to jump to a certain section anyway. So. I'm going to be straight up with you. I'm going to talk about the negatives first. If you're getting a HVX, it's quite heavy. Some people prefer that, you know, it's a bit easier to handle and keep steady and stuff like that, but it is quite heavy. Even without a battery, a tape and a fisheye on it, it is quite a chunky camera. If you're just starting out, that might be a bit of a downside. You might want something a little bit more lighter and a bit more nimble, something like a DSLR or a HVX, which is a bit lighter. Another con of all three of these cameras is the fact that the sensor inside of them isn't true HD. It's actually 960 by 720. Now it gets that number because it's in DVC Pro HD, which has a different aspect ratio for the pixel. So when you put this into a computer and watch it back, the raw file, it may squish itself but when you bring it into um, an editing software such as Premiere Pro, Final Cut, whatever it may be, if it's done correctly, it will stretch it back out to the correct size. I've seen a couple of videos people have shot with these cameras on Instagram and they haven't stretched them back out to the proper size, so you've got quite a squished image. Like I said, this isn't true HD. 960 by 720 is just scratching above standard def. It uses um, pixel shifting and some of the clever shit that Panasonic were a little bit, well, I say reluctant, they were kind of, you know, tiptoeing around the question sometimes, like, it's real HD. Yeah. yeah, if you're looking for a proper HD camera, maybe look for a DSLR or something, or a Sony AX700 or a 7000 or whatever it may be. Those newer cameras have proper HD chips in them. These don't. Now another con of these cameras, the HPX and the HVX, is the media it shoots to. It shoots to these things. Panasonic P2 cards. When these were new, back in 2006 or so, an 8 gig card costs you $1,200. 8 gigabytes at $1,200. Obviously, the newer cards came out, higher capacity. The price went up, 16 gig, $1,500. Obviously, over time, the prices did come down. They released the E-Series cards, which is seemingly the most popular ones with people just starting out. Um, the E-Series cards came out. They were newer, they were supposedly faster and stuff like that and a little bit cheaper, only by a little bit. These were still around about $1,000. Now, they are still kind of expensive. This one could cost you around about 150 to 200 pounds on eBay. However, the Pro, the big pro about these, robust as shit. I mean, you could probably drive over them, dunk it in water, don't do it, don't do it, don't even try it. They're built like brick shit houses, okay? They won't break, you can't snap them, it's aluminium, you know, it's proper build quality, this and they won't corrupt a file. I've never had a card corrupt on me. I've read online. I don't think I've seen at least one person complaining about a card going wrong. So these things are built like fucking tanks. And that's a good thing, because if you're out shooting clips, 
I don't want your shit breaking. You can shoot to tape on the HVX, but it doesn't do HD, only does standard def. Uh, if you want to shoot to a cheaper medium, get the HMC, shoots to uh, SD card. Low light. Now, this is mainly directed towards the HVX, the original HVX, not the 200A or the HPX or the HMC. The original HVX's low light capability was, to be fair, fucking shit. Really wasn't good. It struggles in anything that isn't direct sunlight. Might not be entirely fair. You can push it to around about 3 or 6 dB and it looks okay. Anything above that and it starts falling apart, starts getting really noisy. Out of the 200 series, the 200 and the 200A, the original 200 is easier to find. However, if you want the upgraded chip, which the 200A has, which has the same chip as the HPX and the HMC, if you can, and you find it for a good price, get the 200A. It's got the better chip and it's got a wider lens. The original 200, it can be okay during the daytime, but if you're gonna shoot at night, make sure you have plenty of lights with you because you don't really want to be pushing it to 12, even 9 dB and it starts looking kind of gash. Personally, I don't mind noise. It's just a part of video. I've just accepted it as a part of the look sometimes. So I don't mind noise that much, to be honest. But even I have to say that it gets quite noisy. Yeah, that is just something to bear in mind. The pros of these cameras, I'm sure there's other cons that I've missed out, but I want to kind of skip past all the negatives because I'm sure they'll come up later on in the video. Some of the pros with these cameras, scene files. I fucking love scene files. I've already done a video on them. Adjust the chroma level. If you don't know what that means, this ain't going to help you. You can really choose how your image is going to look. You can get your detail level, your pedestal, your gamma curves. They're really, really nice features. Solely by Panasonic. I know some JVC broadcast cameras could do something similar, but scene files on the Panasonic cameras are excellent. You can really dial in that image you're looking for. The fact that you can match them between like four different types of camera, like the DVX, the HVX, the HPX, and the HMC is fucking beautiful. So you can really dial in and get every camera looking as closely as possible. This one's kind of a pro, but you could almost say this for any kind of standard camcorder. Uh, the zoom. It's nice not having to change a lens on a uh, DSLR, but with this, obviously the zoom's built in. Now with the original 200, since it doesn't have a very wide lens, it's actually got quite a good telephoto distance on it so you can really zoom in. Now, let me just speak to the audience right now, directly, to you at home, to the 14 year old or the 16 year old who thinks, yes, I'm going to buy one of these cameras and film like Strobeck. You do you, not gonna judge him that much about doing that, that's completely okay, but just remember, Strobeck is at least one style out of the many other styles that are out there, okay? And with these cameras, although they are old, and they are, I'll admit that, they are quite old, there is a, a lot of potential in this camera. So don't just limit yourself to one style and just, you know, zooming in and filming your mate's freckles. You know, there's a lot of things these cameras can do, so don't forget that, you know? They are quite powerful, even 14 years later, or however long, however old they are. The other thing I like about these cameras is the fact that although they can be quite daunting if you've never used a Panasonic camera or if you've never filmed before, they can be quite simple to use. You know, they're quite intuitive. The manuals, although they aren't great, they do tell you enough about the camera to get you set up and to get you going. You know, like compared to some camcorders where some of these buttons might be on the inside of a menu, they're all here. You've got your user buttons, you've got your auto manual switch, white balance, gain, got your ND filters, you know, audio controls and stuff like that. They're all on the outside of the camera, the main bits. And you can also, with those user buttons, set these up to do things that you need them to do. You can really get going with this camera quite quickly. It's very run and gun style compared to some cameras where you got to attach a lens, get the microphone on there, then go in, adjust your levels and all that stuff. Want to adjust your levels? Boosh, right there. It's so simple. The other pro that I have with these cameras that some people would probably disagree with me on is the fact that because they aren't true HD, you know, full HD, they still have that kind of, that standard def aesthetic, which some people are still going for. They don't want to go too crisp, but they don't want to go so low def, shall we say. They want that kind of middle ground. 
that's been my little introduction and prologue. Let's jump in to chapter one. So this is going to be a quick look at the AG H3X200, just the kind of buttons and switches on the camera itself. Now the difference between this and the 200A is the fact that the 200A has an upgraded chipset in it and because of that it actually has a wider lens. Right, so let's start at the back. So on the back you've got where the battery goes, you've got this toggle between P2 and tape, you've got this button which goes between playback and camera, then you've got your scene files right here, you've got EVF detail which is useful if you're doing manual focus, and then you've got your two channel audio control here, your levels. These actually glow in the dark, which is pretty cool. Now the way the audio on these cameras work is actually quite interesting, and this applies to the HPX as well, and I think the HMC as well. If you set them differently, say like I used to, which was have one a little bit lower and one a little bit higher, like a normal setting, so you have a safety channel just in case one you know, peaks or whatever, it operates as two mono channels, not stereo. But if you set them pretty much the same, about there, they then work as one stereo channel. Don't just leave them there. You know, I know some people just, you know, don't even bother with them. Actually set your audio, because you don't want it sounding like garbage. And then is the P2 card slot, or slots, I should say. Oop, two of them, as you can see right here. Press that button in and then they eject. When you're putting the card in, do it gently. There are pins in there and they are quite delicate. You don't want to kind of just throw this thing in. So line it up like that and then just gently pop it in and you won't have a problem. And then above that, you have the viewfinder. I have mine set for my left eye because that's my dominant eye, but you can take this rubber off and swap it over. And actually as well, that little ring is a diopter. So it doesn't actually adjust the focus of the camera, it adjusts the focus of the viewfinder. So say you wear glasses and it's not very sharp, you just turn this, you can turn it and adjust it so it's nice and sharp. When you're putting the battery in, which by the way, pins go to the left here, just like this. You wanna put it in nice and gently. Don't thrust it and jiggle it around and whatever. Hold the battery get it into the grooves, nice and gentle, like that. And your camera will last longer than a month. Moving on to the side, we have a whole bunch of buttons and switches and stuff, so we're gonna go through each one of them so you know what to expect. This is your auto and manual switch. Don't bother with the auto. Then you have user buttons. Now these are really, really nice. You can go into the menus and set these to do any number of things. Then we have the white balance switch. So preset is either 5600 Kelvin and 5200 Kelvin. You're gonna wanna hit the uh, white balance button, which is just there. Now that's okay for certain situations, but if you wanna do a manual white balance, switch it to A, get something white like a T-shirt or a white piece of paper and you hit the uh, white balance, which is just here. Then we have gain. So the original H3X200 doesn't have very good low light. So I wouldn't recommend going anywhere above nine at most. If you really need to push it 12, but then it gets really quite, it gets quite noisy. Yeah, I wouldn't push it above nine personally. If you need to go that high, you're gonna need to break out some lights. You can adjust with uh, the different sensitivities in the camera. So you can have, say, you can have it on zero, then three and six, which is how I have it. Or you can have it on like six, then nine, and you know, a, ver a variety of uh, options for the gain switch. Then you have your iris button. Hit that, you go to auto, hit it again, and you go into manual. And then if you're in manual, you control it with this little dial right here. Now moving up to this little cluster of things right here, you've got your ND filter. This is useful on really sunny days, you've got your shutter set and you don't really want to go to like F10, or like F11 or something. Throw a bit of ND in there and then adjust your uh, iris. Then you've got focus assist, which actually blows up the image on the camera, it doesn't do it on the recording, and that way you can get good manual focus. Then you've got your auto manual focus switch right here. So up the top, it's in autofocus and it just does everything by itself. Manual is where you're using the, the uh, focus ring on the front and then pushing it down puts the focus into affinity, which is basically just focusing as far out as it can. 
Then you've got push auto. If you're in manual and something happens, you know, where the camera isn't pointing and you just need to quickly pan over and get it into focus and film it, hit push auto, it'll find the focus and then let go and it goes back to manual. Right, now we've moved into just behind the screen. So you've got your OIS button right here, which is your stabilization. And then you have the zebra button right here. Uh, you can actually set that to different levels in the camera, but basically what Zebra does is it puts a pattern on what's overexposed. Now this is very useful for getting proper exposure. Then you've got counter and reset timecode set right there. The counter basically goes between timecode, user bit, shows you your frame rate and the actual clip duration. Then you have your shutter right here turn it on and off with that and you can go up and down with your shutter. With these if you're shooting in 50p or 60p do not go over 1 500th shutter. 1 1 1,000th, 1 2,000th shutter is way too choppy and it just looks terrible so don't go above them just keep, keep it at like 1 500th that's just all the shutter you need. Then you have your channel audio select and your phantom power. Phantom power is giving power to shotgun microphones or microphones that don't have battery power. Turn these off if you haven't got a microphone plugged in because these do just eat power. Then you have your channel one and channel two select. So say again, if you have an XLR microphone plugged in, say into channel two, you set these both to channel two and that one microphone is going to both channels. So you have two microphones plugged in, say like an, a shotgun mic and a wireless mic like I'm using right now. You'd have channel one on channel one and then channel two on channel two. But if you're not using a microphone, keep them on internal left and right. One thing I should mention as well about the DVC Pro HD cameras is that when you have a microphone plugged in, it will then route the internal microphones to channel three and four because DVC Pro HD does four channels of sound. But if you have the microphones plugged in, that haven't routed them to channel two, uh, to input two or input one, it will then use the internal mics for channel one and channel two, and then the external microphone via the XLR as channel three and channel four. So bear that in mind. So, because there's been a new number of occasions where, where I've had the microphone plugged in, but I've forgotten to switch these over, but I've been thankfully saved because the third and fourth channel have had the uh, external microphone going into them. So that's uh, quite lucky to have, quite a nice feature of DVC Pro HD. So this is the front end of the camera. This is the lens hood, do not lose it. Lens hood comes off with this little screw. It uses the bayonet ring around the camera, get it on at the angle and then turn it. Do not force it, you'll break the lens. Now the HVX200 and the 200A use an 82 mil filter thread, which is this thing right here. Now it's a little bit of a weird one, and you can't really get any point free fish eyes for it. So you're gonna to wanna to get yourself an 82 mil to 72 mil step down ring, just like that. And I can throw an Optecker on there, no problem. Now, if you're lucky enough to have the extreme fish eye or silly enough to spend eight grand on one, uh, you would use the bayonets here and you wanna get some rails to slot underneath the camera. So this is the line mic selector for input one and input two. If you're doing like concert work where you're getting a feed from a soundboard or a mixing desk or whatever it may be, you're gonna to wanna to put these on line. But if you're just using an XLR microphone, uh, just leave them on mic. So this is your white balance button right here. Uh, if you're in preset, that goes between 5600 Kelvin and 3200 Kelvin. If you put it into A, you can do your manual white balance hitting that button. And actually, if you're going between 1080i and 720p, you hold that button down even longer and you get a black balance, which actually resets your black level so you don't get kind of grayish looking blacks. And the most important thing, and it's so stupid, but it does happen, this right here, is the zoom toggle. Right now I'm in manual. You can see that I can control the lens manually. But if you put that into servo, this is locked. Now don't touch that. Do not touch it at all, actually. Because if you touch that, when it's set to servo, it will break. So if you get it and it's not zooming in for whatever reason, that's probably because it's, put in, it's been put to manual. Put it into servo and then the zoom rockers work. But do not touch the lens. Don't force it, don't do anything like that. You will break the lens, and my God, it costs a lot to fix. So down here, you've got your two XLR ports. Plug it in, if you wanna get it out, you push that in, and then you pull the cable out. So right here, you have a four pin fire wire. Fuck four pin fire wire. Terrible, cheap, nasty connector, and it always fucking breaks. Just above that, you also have your headphone port. And just here, 
USB 2.0 port. Yeah, this is how I get footage across. You can just plug a USB cable straight into that, plug it into your computer and drag and drop. Moving down, we have the SD card port. Now this is just a bog standard SD card port. I think it can accept SDHC, but it can't accept SDXC in all the newer versions. Remember, this camera came out in 2006, so SD was kind of the norm back then. So go on eBay, buy yourself a bog standard SD card. No, you can't record video to it. The SD card slot is primarily for scene file, like saving scene files to the card or saving user files to the card or actually uploading metadata to the camera. So yeah, you can't record video to it, unfortunately. But if you want to use SD cards, get yourself a HMC. And then just to the side of that, you have the on and off switch and the record button right there. So like I said before, you've got your zoom rockers right here. You've got in and out, as you can see. They are pressure sensitive, so if you hold it in gently, it will go slowly. If you push it in hard, it will go faster. You've got a record check button right there, which just plays back the last couple of seconds of footage. And then on the top, you've got your cold shoe where you put camera lights or whatever else. There's a record button up here, and there is actually a zoom button in here, but I've got some Tadashi grip on there and you can't see it. If your camera comes with the shock mount by Panasonic, that is where it screws into, right there. Now this is kind of tricky to film, but as you can see here, here's the menu button. Now this is what you use to get around the camera menus and the playback menus. So you've got menu there, you've got up and down, enter and stuff like that. And then you've also got your volume controls for playback. So that's pretty much it for the HVX 200. One last thing I forgot to mention, I nearly swapped over then. When you're buying this camera, a lot of people just put it as AG, or just put it as Panasonic HVX200. Now, hopefully, they've been clever enough to post a photo of this, which is the model number and serial number on the viewfinder right here. I might just, I might flip the image so you can see it properly. So the P, right, when it says AG HVX200P, that doesn't mean PAL, okay? That means Panasonic. The PAL version of this will have an E on it. Okay, so when you're looking at this camera on eBay or whatever, see if there is a photo of the model number on the back. So if it says something like AG HVX 200P, like mine for an example, it's an NTSC model and the original one. If it says AG HVX 200 AP, that means it's the updated model of the HVX, but it's still NTSC. If it says AG HVX 200 AE, that will be the updated model, but the British version. And then there's of course the 201, 202, 205 and all that stuff. And the P and the A and all that stuff and the E all apply to that as well. I just thought I'd mention that just in case you ended up buying, like I did, the wrong one. Now we will move on to the HPX. Right, so this is the Panasonic HPX 170, although this is actually the 171. Um, but this does apply to the 170, 171, 172, 173, 174, all the variants of this camera. So the battery goes in like most normal camcorders um, compared to the HVX. You press your thumb there at the push tab right here, push that in, push up, and the battery comes out. Also pins to the bottom. Push in at the top, push down, locks into place. Now this camera doesn't have a tape slot in it, so it's purely just a P2 camera, so there's no little toggle to go between P2 and tape. But you do have a mode button, so you can go from camera, playback, and PC. And again, if you hold it down, you go into PC and you transfer your footage. Now instead of having to uh, use a user button to have a slot select, you actually have a dedicated slot select button, which is quite nice. You can go back and forth between the first and second card. Moving up, you've got the P2 card and SD card port. There you go, as you can see. Again, similar like with the HVX, be very gentle with this, you don't wanna break the cards. Cards go in nice and gently, and there you go. And pop these to the side so they don't break the door. Uh, the SD card slot is actually up here now as well. You've got a six pin locking Firewire cable, which is a thousand times better than the four pin nonsense that most DV cameras have. Moving on to the side, again, kind of similar to the HVX, but there are a few things and button layouts that are a little bit different, so I'll just run through them all again. 
Right, so right here, we have the audio controls. Now, compared to the H3X, these aren't on the back. These are actually on the bottom, on the side. The nice thing about these is they actually have a little door there, so you can protect them from just accidentally being bumped. Here's a new feature of the uh, HPX, well, a different feature of the HPX. You can actually choose what the focus wheel does. You've got focus or iris. Now, personally, I just keep it on focus. There's really no need to fuck around with it. Um, there's already an iris wheel at the front. Iris, now, the HPX has the same chip as the HPX 200A and the HMC 150, so it has the better chip and it's better in low light. I am more than happy to push this camera at 12 dB of gain. 18, it looks a little, it looks quite mushy, but 12 dB I'm quite happy to use in low light situations. However, with the HVX, again, I wouldn't go above nine. So with this little cluster of buttons right here, you've got an extra ND filter compared to the H3X200. You've got 1 fourth, 1 16th, and 1 64th. Even more control of your light. Uh, you've also got your user buttons. They've been moved from the bottom to the cluster here. So you've got 1, 2, and 3 again. Another thing they've done is move the servo manual zoom toggle to the side of the camera. So when you're in servo, you can use the zoom rocker. Don't touch the zoom ring. When it's in manual, zoom rockers are disengaged and the lens is free to be used manually. So behind the screen, kind of a similar situation with the uh, HVX. You've actually got an LCD button. Now what that does is actually, you can customize it in the settings. You can either have it flip the image, say you were using a 35 millimeter depth of field adapter, which sometimes does flip the image, or you can change the brightness of the backlight. Then you have the EVF detail there, which you don't really, I mean, you can use it if you want to. The focus assist is a lot more user friendly and it's actually a lot better than on the uh, HVX. And a really nice one right here is the waveform monitor. Now, if you want to get really, really precise with your exposure and your color and stuff, you can open up the waveform monitor and really get your exposure just how you want it. It's a really nice feature. So thankfully on the HPX and the HMC, they put the menu buttons back on the side where they should have been the entire time. So you've got your menu button, you've got thumbnail, you've got your jog little knob stick thingy here click it into enter and you play back and you can control the menu from there and your audio level for uh, playback in the headphones or whatever or on the speaker is right there. Now compared to the HVX this just uses a kind of locking style lens hood it doesn't have any screws or anything you just put it on at an angle and twist it and it locks into place. You want to be careful with this because they can and probably will break so do it gently, don't just rip the damn thing off. Now, the HMC and the HPX 170 has a 72 mil filter thread on there. Now, if you wanna put an Optecker on there or something, you could just screw it on, but the problem is, is that the rear element of the Optecker and the front element of the uh, HPX slash HMC is, it's too close together and they actually start touching. So I highly recommend getting yourself a 72 mil spacer. This doesn't have any labeling on it, but it is a 72 mil spacer. You just screw that onto there and there you go. And then it gives it some space. Moving up, we have the USB 2.0 port, which you can use for transferring the video across. And now moving to the side of the handle, this, Oh, I'm going to have a bit of a rant about this. This is the on and off switch for the handle. If this is off, which it is now, it disengages the record button and the zoom rockers, which are here. I fucking hate this switch. This switch shouldn't fucking exist. But they didn't put a fucking cover on the on and off switch. I fucking hate it. Fucking stupid. Again, like with the HVX200, when you're going to buy one of these online, see if you can get a photograph of the model number of the camera, because sometimes they may put 17, AG HVX170 or HMC150 and they've got it wrong. So look for the model number. If it says AG HPX170, that is the American version. It only does American frame rates. If you've got one like mine, which is the HPX171E, that means it can do NTSC frame rates and British frame rates, PAL uh, frame rates, and they can go back and forth. 
you'll also notice the E, which stands for Europe. Then you've also got the HPX 172, the 173, 174, 175. You'll want to Google uh, those. I'm not entirely sure on the frame rates and stuff. I know one of them is specific to Russia, Japan, like Asia. Uh, Australia has their own version as well, I believe. So there are a couple of different versions of this camera. If you can't find a 170, but say like the 175 does the same frame rate as the 170, then it might be worth looking at getting a 175 purely because if it does the same frame rate and you can find one, well, you might as well get it, you know, you might as well get it if it does the same frame rate. It's basically the same camera at that point. Sometimes those ones will cost a little bit more because they might not have sold as well in those countries, but it's something to look out for, especially if you want to save some um, key phrases on eBay or something like that. So yeah, that's pretty much the HPX 170 slash 171. Yeah, also the bayonet is different on this. The HPX and the HMC share a bit. I fucking hate double O's. So in this chapter, we're gonna be talking about fisheyes and microphones for the Panasonic cameras. Now, regarding the fisheyes, you've realistically got two options. You've either got the Opteca 72 mm fisheye, or 52 if you wanna do four by three HD, or if you've got the money, the Extreme fisheye. Now, I don't own one, otherwise I'd be showing it to you right now. Um, pros of that one, purpose built for the camera, good quality glass, really wide. Downsides to that lens, it's very heavy, puts a lot of strain on the handle of the camera, especially on the HVX, it had a problem with the handle snapping, I'll include photos here. And the other thing as well is that it's very, very expensive. The lowest I've seen an extreme go for on like the used market was around about $4,500. And the highest I've seen it go for was around about 7,500. Shout out Lurk NYC. If you've got the money for an extreme, that's great. Uh, when you're buying it, make sure it's actually the one for your camera. The bayonet on the HVX and the HPX is different. So a HPX fisheye won't fit on a HVX. You'll wanna make sure that they have the correct bayonet fittings, otherwise it won't fit. You'll also wanna make sure that you have a camera rail support system. It's this kind of thing down here, two rails, 15 millimeter rods that go to about there. Uh, if you don't have them, do not put the fisheye on your camera. Um, it will just rip the lens off the camera. You won't, wanna, you won't want that to happen. It's very expensive to fix. It literally puts so much weight on the front, it just pulls it off. So don't do that. Get the 15 millimeter rods right here, screw it in and you'll be good to go. So now that's out of the way, let's talk about the Opteca. Now I've already talked about the Opteca in so much bloody detail at this point that you probably already know about it, but just in case you don't, I'll talk about it. It's a Chinese knockoff of the MK2. Uh, you can get them in a variety of different sizes, like 72mm, 48mm and all that kind of stuff. If you're gonna be using them on the Panasonic cameras, you're gonna to wanna to get the 72mm fisheye. Now the HPX has a 72mm thread, However, because of how the lens works and the fact that the actual rear element right here sticks out, you're gonna wanna get a spacer ring, the 72 mm one. That way, when you attach it, the rear element and the front glass of the HPX won't be touching, which you really don't wanna do, especially if you're screwing it on and off. If you're gonna be using the 72 mm fisheye on the HVX, you're gonna wanna get a 82 mm to 72 mm step down ring. Uh, there are no 82 mil 0.3 fish eyes, I don't believe. So you're gonna have to get that step down ring. Very cheap, you can get them on eBay for a couple of pounds and you just screw on and then you can get the fish eye on there. And in fact, because of the spacer, oh, because of the step down ring, you don't even need to worry too much about spacer rings. If you want to, you can add them, you know, it just gives you a bit more vignette and it kind of makes it a bit wider. But if you're gonna do that, I do recommend cropping the image slightly in <laughs> this is a 52 mil. Mmm, <laughs> idiot. But yeah, if you're gonna be uh, adding spacer rings to your HVX or your HPX, uh, make sure that you crop in a little bit in post. You don't want too much vignette going around the edges. And that's it really for the fish eyes. This is just my opinion, you know. I don't think the Extreme is a very good investment. Unless you've been using these cameras for a long time, you really love the look of them and that kind of stuff, maybe it's a good investment if you can find it for a good price. Um, however, these are slowly phasing out of use within the industry. Um, 
There are better cameras out there now. If you want to be taken seriously, you can get a better camera that shoots better resolution and is just easier to run, you know, easier to get bits for. And because it's newer, won't die so quickly. Yeah, so if you're really that dedicated to using one of these cameras and you want to get the extreme and you can afford it, go for it. There's no problem with that. But if you want to kind of stick with the times maybe and you want to get something a bit newer, maybe avoid the extreme. Maybe you're just getting this for like a year or two or maybe just for one project or something. Maybe you're just borrowing it. I wouldn't worry about the extreme fisheye too much. Although it is wider and the glass is better quality, at the end of the day, it's the subject that matters. You can make a really good edit on a phone, you know? So I don't really think it matters that much. That's just my opinion. I know there's some diehard people out there like, if you've never used one, you'll never know and never appreciate and all that stuff. Yeah, okay, that's cool. That's your opinion. But again, it's an $8,000 piece of glass that you're pointing at someone doing a fucking manual, you know? It's the same thing every fucking time. It doesn't really matter what it is. As long as you shot it good, as long as it's framed properly and your settings are good, it doesn't matter that much, okay? It's the subject that matters at the end of the day. But that's just my opinion. I'm sure there'll be people, people who disagree with me in the comments. So this section is going to be talking about the microphones on these two cameras and also shotgun microphones. If you're shooting fisheye, the internal microphones are more than decent enough. But if you're shooting long lens, I would suggest getting a shotgun microphone. Now this one I'm holding right now was actually gifted to me by my ex-boss. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, it's just some cheap Sony one that came, you know, that comes with some of their semi-professional broadcast cameras. It does okay. I don't have a wind sock for it, so it's only good for like indoors and less windy situations. But the microphone I like to use most of the time is this, which is a Rode NTG1. Now there's an NTG2, an NTG3, but with these cameras, since they can provide power to the microphone via the 48 phantom volt switch, I don't think the NTG2 is very necessary. The NTG2 actually has a battery compartment in it, whilst this one doesn't. It takes power from the cameras. Very nice microphone. I've got a proper Rode wind sock for it, and I've also got a proper shock mount for it. The shock mount these cameras come with, if yours comes with one, as I've mentioned in the tour of the camera, that screws in there, it's okay for stuff like this, like kind of smaller sized, shotgun microphones like this. So if you're gonna be using one of the bigger XLR microphones like this Rode, you'll probably wanna get a proper shock mount. Now you can get these from the company that you buy your microphone from, most of the time anyway. This is an official Rode one. Push it in there, in between the uh, elastic bands. It may be a bit different for your brand of microphone, but they're pretty much the same all around. Slide that on there, screw that on. And then obviously you'd have the cable going into it. And there you go. It also lifts the microphone up so it's not just right here and dangling in shot. So this is a really nice method of uh, getting some good clean sound when you're doing long lens. So when it comes to these microphones, the external ones, you can get stereo XLR microphones. These are only mono, however, but you can, like I just said, you can get stereo ones. I personally haven't used them. Again, if you want to look into stereo XLR microphones, I'd go online and do some of your own research. I haven't experimented or tried any. I might do though, at some point, try out some proper stereo microphones. Now I know what you're saying. Why would I want to use a mono microphone on a camera that does stereo? Now here's the thing, okay? A lot of web edits, and I mean a lot of web edits, by professionals and by amateurs have been in mono, okay? And now this is only something that I've really noticed in the last couple of months, okay? I never really paid attention to it up until recently when I started taking sound a little bit more serious. Most edits shot on these Panasonic cameras have been in mono. It sounds like it's stereo because it's coming from the left and right ear, but all the sound is just directly in the center. There's no left to right, like with the VX1000. It's well known for how good its microphone is. These cameras have stereo microphones. It's just the editors or the people making the videos, the filmers, aren't doing, they aren't setting up their sequence properly. When you see these cameras in proper stereo and you can, you know, hear the skater go from left to right if they go along the frame, it sounds so much different.
when it's just slap bang in the center, okay, it just sounds quite muddy, there's no depth to it, you know. One of the main reasons why the VX microphone is so popular, not only because of how it interprets sound and, you know, with the pops and stuff like that, but it's also because it's stereo, okay. When the skater moves to the left of the frame, you can hear it out of your left ear that he's gone to the left-hand side. It really brings you into the image. I mean, they do say, like, sound is, like, 50% of the fucking picture, or even, like, 90%, some people would say. These cameras do stereo sound, okay? We'll talk about that later on in chapter 10. In chapter 10, when we talk about editing. It's a stereo microphone for f So let's talk about the media that the Panasonic cameras use. So if you're gonna be getting a HVX or a HPX, they shoot to P2 cards, these things. If you're getting a HMC, they shoot to SD cards. So I'm gonna talk about P2 first because that's what I have around me. Then I'll move on to the HMC and SD cards. So the Panasonic cameras have two card slots in the back, which is quite nice because you can double up on cards and get more recording time. The cards themselves come in a variety of sizes. You can get four gigabyte, eight gigabyte, 16 gigabyte, 32 gigabyte, and they max out at 64 gigabyte, like this one. Don't bother with eight gigabytes. They were just as the camera just come out. You're really better off getting something like 16 or 32 gigabytes. If you're just shooting skateboarding and you're going in and you're deleting clips that you don't want, a card like that should get you between about a day's worth of filming, probably. Um, however, I managed to get quite lucky with my purchases and actually managed to get a whole bunch of P2 cards. I've actually got four cards that came with one camera. So I've got an E-Series 64 gigabyte card here. I've got another E-Series card, but this is 32 gig. And these are all the same, 32 gig E-Series cards. Now the first set of cards that came out for the Panasonic cameras were the R-Series. They maxed out, I believe, 32 gigabytes. They're the slower cards, they're harder to find because they were just as the camera came out in around 2006, 2007. Then the next series of cards that came out was the E-Series cards like I've got right here. These came out a couple, about 2008, I'd say, just when the uh, HPX came out. These are a little bit cheaper and they also maxed out at 64. Then, around 2009, 2010, Panasonic released the last set of cards that these cameras can hold, which is the F series of cards. Now you can tell the difference between the E and the F series purely on the color, and also the fact that they turn the logo sideways for some reason. But you can tell the difference between them. The R series card actually looks like dark blue or maybe even black so if you can't tell what type of card it is it should say on the card itself and you can tell by the color now if you've got an original hvx and you end up with f series cards you'll want to update the firmware in the camera because the camera came out a few years before these cards were released the firmware doesn't recognize them and can throw up some proper nasty issues it's very easy to do the firmware you just got to make sure you have a compatible sd card that goes in there pop on the panasonic website follow the instructions and you should be good to go now these are technically PC cards or PC MCIA cards. If you have an old enough laptop, these would actually pop in and you can just drag and drop the files across. I know a lot of people were wondering, can you get an SD card to work in these cameras? For scene files and user files and stuff like that, yeah, sure, you can do that. But you can't actually record any video to an SD card on these cameras. It just doesn't work. The way these P2 cards are set up is that they've got four SD cards inside of them a little chip that raids them together in a RAID 1 or a RAID 0 array. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. It's not that important. But basically, these are very, very important. You can't just get an adapter. It won't work in the camera. You can't trick it that way. So don't waste your time. Don't waste your money. It just doesn't work. You can get these for around about £100, including the uh, lower capacity ones, and you'll be good to go. If you're lucky like me, you might come across a seller who's selling a whole bunch of them with the camera. If you can, go for that. If not, plenty of people on eBay are selling these right now. Since I don't have a HMC, I'm going to be referring to my notes here. So if you do own a HMC and there's something that needs to be corrected, feel free to tell me down below. So what I've written down here is that you need a classics or higher SD HC card and the limit of card is 32 gigabytes. 
Now, you may think, oh, well, that's not as good as the Panasonic because you can get 64 gigabyte, but because it shoots AVC HD, you actually get more recording time than you would on a 32 gig card in a HPX or a HVX. So it's not too bad. Like I said, the main difference between these two cameras is what they shoot to. Panasonic DVC Pro HD goes to a P2. AVC HD goes to an SD card. It's pretty simple like that. And like I said before regarding the firmware, when you get one of these cameras, if there is any weird P2 card error or something, or you buy one of the newer cards and it stops working or it just doesn't work in general, the first thing I would do, update the firmware in the camera. It's very simple to do but make sure you follow the instructions very closely, otherwise you will end up bricking the damn thing. So do it properly, it's very simple to do. The instructions it comes with is very, very clear. I will leave links, by the way, to the HVX, HPX, and the HMC's firmware down below. If you're lucky like me, you might... So in this chapter, we're talking about batteries. Now straight away, something I've just found out is that the HMC doesn't actually use the same type of battery as the HVX and the HPX for some fucking reason. Apparently they've got different grooves in the uh, batteries that you use for them for some fucking reason. So stupid. However, if you're say moving from a DVX100 or something, the batteries will work in a HVX and a HPX. As you can see here, I've had this battery for nine years now. That's actually the original sticker I put on it back in 2012. And this came with my DVX and it works in this camera, works in the HVX, works just fine. So if you're looking online and you're trying to get batteries, if it says like, oh, battery for Panasonic DVX or HVX or something like that, those batteries will work in either three of the cameras. They won't work in the HMC for some fucking reason. I will say avoid old new stock like this one right here, this is an old new stock battery I got a couple of years ago for my birthday. It's terrible. New old stock, it's been sat there for a while and the cells inside the battery don't hold a very good charge. This one for an instance doesn't even last 10 minutes, maybe half an hour at a push. Not a very good battery. So you're better off getting online, going on eBay and looking for some good third party batteries. Now, all the batteries for these cameras, if you use different ones, have different like names and stuff like this one. This is the one that came with my DVX. is a Panasonic VW-VBD55, 5400 milliamp. And then this one, which I believe came with my HVX possibly, is a Panasonic CGA-D54S, which is also 5400 milliamp hours, I should say. So two different model name of battery by the same manufacturer, same amount of power in them, but they've got different names, different model names. Very weird. If you just type in DVX100B or HVX200 or HPX battery online, you should find some good batteries. Like I said, avoid old, new old stock. It's kind of pointless. They won't last very long. It may be an official Panasonic battery, but you're really not gonna get much life out of them. If you might get lucky, but I wouldn't guarantee it. So chargers, if your camera comes with one, that's great. If not, uh, you might be able to go online and find one of these, which is an official Panasonic battery charger. Takes all the types of batteries you can get for these cameras. This is the one for the DVX. Fits in nicely. Even the uh, old ones like this or the old new stock or whatever it is. Yeah, you can get third party chargers as well. Again, it's one of those where I'd be quite careful. Don't go for the uber cheap ones, those like nasty things where you can slot an adapter on and then the battery fits. I highly recommend getting a proper charger. When it comes to battery maintenance, I mean, realistically, it's the same thing with most things. If you're out and it's a cold day, keep them in your pockets, keep them nice and warm to make sure you get as much life out of them. Don't drop them, don't slam it into the camera, that type of thing. Just be careful with them really, treat them as you would any other type of battery. Now another thing I'd recommend getting is one of these, which is a Panasonic kind of false battery kind of thing. Plug that into the back of your camera, take the other end, plug it into your official Panasonic AC adapter, and you can power the camera off the wall. Now you may think, oh well I don't need that, I've got plenty of batteries. But if it comes to transferring clips, and you've only got one battery left, and it just happens to have just a little bit of power in there, you really don't want to be transferring footage, and then your battery dies. So I'd recommend getting one of these. I'm pretty sure you can get these on eBay. Sometimes they come with the cameras when you buy them. 
but yeah, very quite useful, especially if you just want to do kind of sit down things like I do. These come in quite handy. So in this chapter, we're going to be talking about resolution and frame rate. Now, just to give you an answer, just in case you just don't care about anything else I'm about to say, 720p, 50p or 60p. There you go. Unless you're shooting for broadcast, keep it at 720p. That's about it. So to elaborate on this and why I don't shoot 1080i, the sensor in these cameras is 960 by 720 like I've said before. So you then get your pixel shifting and all that stuff and then you get to 1080i. But then to get to 720p, it's either scaling it down and making a progressive image or it's not scaling it up at all and it's having to do less fucking about with the image. I don't know the correct answer to that. I don't know if it is actually scaling up and then scaling back down or if it's just scaling up to 720. I don't know. I couldn't answer that. I've done a lot of Googling and done a lot of research. Panasonic says one thing, then Barry Green says another, and then all these people who think they're experts on these cameras say another thing. So it's kind of up in the air a little bit. Depending on who you believe, it's either upscaled or it's not. So there you go. 1080i doesn't really give you much more detail. It barely looks like 1080 anyway. Again, these are upscaled images you're looking at. So you're better off just shooting at 720p to save yourself the uh, minor headache. When it comes to frame rate, it's kind of a simple one. If you're in America or anywhere that uses the NTSC standard, you'll be shooting at 24, 30 or 60. If you're in Britain or anywhere that uses the power frame rates, you'll be at 25 and 50. Really, at this point, it doesn't make too much difference. Um, there's web videos shot in the UK shot at 60p. There's American video, well, not many American videos shot at 50. It, really, frame rate at this point doesn't matter too much. The only time it is going to matter is when you're mixing footage from two different filmers or two different cameras and whatnot. Like the camera you're seeing me on right now, the HPX171, can do NTSC and PAL. This is an American HVX. It can only do American frame rates. So that's why I've had to shoot this in 24p because the PAL variant doesn't have 24, it's only got 25. So to make sure the footage matches, I'm shooting at the same frame rate in the same uh, system frequency as it's called in the camera. So this is why I prefer these region switchable variants of these cameras like the 171. You can go between American and PAL. With the bog standard HVX, you are locked in. Unless you buy a European one, then you get the uh, European frame rate and that's it. I believe the 201, maybe the 202, one of those variants might do region switching. Not entirely sure, it's a little bit of a gray area. So yeah, if you can, maybe look at getting one of those because if you can do NTSC and PAL, it's fucking great. But I have a feeling you can't, mainly because of the tape drive. I don't think you can get region switchable tape drives, which is what makes me think that it might be PAL or NTSC and then that's it. Obviously it doesn't really matter, no one's probably going to be using the tape drive anyway, but if you do need to use it, you might be stuck at one frame rate. So make sure you get the camera that matches your region, okay? Say you're in the UK, don't just get a bog standard 200. Make sure you get a 200E, which stands for Europe. If it says P on the side of it, that just stands for PAL, as I mentioned on the uh, camera body tour. Um, if you want a region switchable HPX 170, get the 171 like I have. So I can do American frame rates and British frame rates. Although they don't pop up as much as the bog standard 200 and the 170, they are out there. They might also be a little bit more expensive, but having the benefit of having the multiple different frame rates and the different um, region capabilities is worth it, in my opinion. I find it very useful because I've got two NTSC cameras, my HVX and my DVX, but I've also got a British VX1000, a PAL VX1000. So I can match this camera with two different regions and three cameras, which is quite nice. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Just moving on a little bit as well, these cameras do more than just 50p and 60p. I know it's like, oh, you need it for skateboarding, but you can do 24, 25, 30, and especially if you've only got, say, an eight gig card or 16 gigabytes or something, shooting in the 24pn, 25pn and 30pn, you get more recording space out of your card. So say in like a 32 gigabyte card, 
in 50p or 60p, you might only get 32 minutes. In one of the PN frame rates, 24, 25, 30, you get around about 60 minutes, maybe more than that. So if you don't really need slow motion or anything like that, and you're just gonna be doing straight cuts, no slow motion or anything like that, it might be worth looking at shooting at 24 or 25. You know, it's not something that everyone does, but it might be worth considering. And also well known is the two FPS hack. Now, if you've ever watched any of these videos from like Ty Evans or anything like that, basically when these cameras were in their prime, you'll have noticed a lot of time lapses and stuff like that. All of them done in camera. Well, I say all of them, but most of them are done in camera. And that's with the 2FPS hack. Now it's very simple, there's plenty of videos on it, but I'll quickly run through what it is. When you save your scene file to your SD card, it writes a little text document, okay? Take that SD card, pop it in your computer, and you edit one thing in that text document, save it back out, pop it back into the uh, camera, and there you go, 2FPS. Very, very simple. Barry Green's even got a little video on how to do it. And with this, if you get your camera in film mode, and open the shutter up to 360 degrees, it's beautiful. Light trails, you've got clouds going over. It's honestly such a useful tool. And it's so nice. It's really quite handy, especially for like time lapse of clouds going over. There's endless possibilities, you know. Another thing, nearly forgot. If you're doing, for whatever reason, in-camera slow motion, you lose the sound. If you want to do in-camera slow motion with sound, you'll need either a separate camera or a sound recorder. But at that point, you might as well just be shooting at 50p or 60p. So in this chapter, we're going to be talking about scene files, and I've got a couple of notes here just to keep me on track. Um, firstly, just to get this out of the way, I can't give you exact numbers to certain scene files, not because I don't want to or not, you know, because I'm being a dick or anything. It's because scene files are quite subjective. Some people might look at mine and think, God, that looks shit. And then some people think, oh, that looks great. So I'm not just going to hand out a bunch of scene files and say, those are the ones that you should use, because at the end of the day, it is subjective. And I do highly recommend playing around with it, just tweaking certain things here and there and just figuring out what works best for you. So, to put it simply, scene files are basically painting the image in camera. Instead of colour correcting and adding sharpness and contrast in the edit, you can do most of that in camera. Now there are some benefits to this. The fact that you don't need to sit around whilst editing, colour correcting and adjusting the image is quite helpful, especially if you've got quite a uh, short turnaround and you've got to film it, edit it and get it out really quickly. The Berics do it and a lot of professional filmers do it too. It's, just, it's one less thing they have to think about when it comes to the edit. Because of how much flexibility scene files actually give you, you can have more than one image in the camera. I know, shocking. Now there is one negative I'd like to say about the scene files and it's the fact that they aren't really well kind of named and stuff. So if you don't know what you're looking at, or if you don't know what they're called or what they actually do, you could end up fucking your image in a really bad way. And because the screen on these cameras are fucking awful, you really don't get an idea of what they're going to look like. So I highly recommend taking the time, get the camera out and just play with the settings and dump the footage to your computer. Get it on a nice big screen and then you can make decisions. Do not make decisions on scene files or on the image using the inbuilt screen because it is fucking awful. It's so terrible. No detail. Yeah, I'm not going to rant on about it. Like scene files are a really easy thing to get wrong and make your image look bad. And that could be said for most DV and HD cameras. I'd rather have a kind of a more soft, flatter image than looking back in a couple of years where the sharpness is turned up. There's like absolutely no shadow detail. You know, I'd rather have that flexibility. I can come back in the future, look at this footage and think, okay, I might need to use that in a future project, but now because I've shot it flatter, I can try and match it to whatever future camera I might have. And that gives me that flexibility. So there's that. Now I've already talked about scene files in a previous video, which I recommend going and watching wherever it may be on the screen or down here or whatever. Um, I don't think that's as good as a video as it could have been but it's definitely a stepping stone in the right direction. I suggest going online, doing reading, looking on forums and all that kind of stuff, because there's a lot of different opinions out there about scene files. Some people say that you should have the sharpness to this or the sharpness to that or the gamma, blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. 
it's really not a definitive thing. That's why I can't really just give you numbers. It's such an ever-expanding thing. I mean, there's still people out there now playing around with these cameras and discovering, oh, if you have it like this, this looks amazing, you know. It's never just a set thing. So like I said, play around with it, find something that you're happy with, but don't just stay at that. Play around with it, experiment, try new things, maybe turn the sharpness down, turn it up, change the gamma and all that kind of stuff. Play around with it, don't just stick to the same one. Uh. So in this chapter we're going to be looking at the menus. Now the original version of this chapter was something like an hour long. I talked about both cameras menus, I talked about the playback, I even talked about the DV side of the HVX200. That's a bit excessive, it's a bit long. So for this version I'm just going to go through pretty much the most important things with inside of the menus. Now if there are differences between the HPX and the H3X I will put a little annotation on the screen just to point it out or I will mention it just in case. Um, but other than that let's hop into the menus and I'll point out the things that I use and the most useful things. So in menu number one we have the scene files. This is basically just how you paint your image, what kind of gamma you have, pedestal, chroma phase, stuff like that. This is basically just painting your image and how much sharpness you have in the image. I've already talked about this in another chapter so I won't go into too much detail. But the most important ones are realistically master pedestal, gamma and your detail level and your matrix. In switch mode we have mid and high gain. I have mine set to 3 and 6. I have my user buttons set to 18 dB gain, shot mark and level meter, although you could have that as whatever you want it to. I just wanted something there just to you know, fill up the gap. Then I have my focus assist on both, manual focus assist off. For the waveform monitor, I have waveform and vector scope, and the LCD button is set to LCD backlight. Auto switch, I don't really worry about this because I don't really use the auto functions on this camera. In recording setup, I'll have my camera in 72060 or 72050. If I want to do something a bit more cinematic, I'll go down and use 720p, 24pn or 720p, 25pn. I don't bother with the standard def as I've mentioned and the 1080 is also kind of pointless. Moving on we have mic automatic level control. I have this turned on so that my sound doesn't peak too much. AV in and out setup. This is a silly one but it is important. Internal mic. Turn that on otherwise all of a sudden none of your footage will have sound. Now in display setup we have the zebra detection. I have one on 80 and one on 100. My marker on. Date and time, level meter. Zoom and focus as numbers instead of the feet or meters. Carbon battery on. P2 card remain, total. Basic stuff like that. The record counter, total or clip. I prefer total, but if you want, you can have it as clip. Other functions, we have PC mode, which is quite useful in the later chapters when we talk about getting the footage off. Since I use USB, it's on USB device. Access LED, which is basically just showing you what the car's doing on the back, you know, those little LEDs. Record lamp, we have both rear and front. I like to have it on both, unless there's a situation where I want to be a bit more covert, then I'll just have the rear one on. Beep sound, I've never heard it actually make a beep, so I don't know if that's broken or not, but it's on anyway. Clock set, and that's pretty much it. Oh, and system frequency if I want to go between NTSC and PAL. And that's pretty much it. So, this is the playback menu. This is where you're going to see all the clips that you've shot and all that kind of stuff. Now, when you hit the menu button, you're going to see a couple of options. You've got thumbnail, operation, property, and metadata. Let's have a look at the first one. As you can see, you've got a variety of different settings. This just basically eliminates different clips to say like marked clips it'll show marked clips and here you can see that you can choose between which card slot is showing up on screen and here you can actually choose how big the thumbnail is if you want the date and display to show you know stuff like that moving on we've got operation now in operation you've got delete format repair clip reconnection and exchange thumbnail now delete is just deleting clips Format is just formatting either the first P2 card, the second P2 card, or even the SD card if you really wanted to. And then repair clip, 
You use if your battery's died in the camera and it's gone all funky with the clip, you hit that and it'll fix the clip for you, up until when the battery died or something like that. Reconnection in exchange thumbnail, not entirely sure, so I'll just leave it at that. Now in property, you've got clip property, which just shows you the information about the different clips you've shot. So you can see you've got the info about the video, the audio, who shot it, the scenario. This all relates to the metadata, which you've either set or you haven't set in advance. Then you've got the card status, which just shows you how much time you've got on either card and the remaining time, or you can even change it to show uh, the used time as well. Then you've got SD card, which just shows you uh, what type of SD card you've got in there and the size. It says number of clips. That only really makes sense if you're using like a big HPX like 370, which can record proxies to SD cards, I believe. And that's where you change the uh, setting in the card status menu right there. Change that to remain or used. This is your firmware of the camera. As you can see, I've got version 1.10. That's the latest firmware of the camera, you can't get any more. I do recommend when you get these cameras that you do update the firmware. Then you've got the metadata, where you can load in your different metadata files that you've saved to the, C uh, to the SD card. As you see, I've got four different scenarios there, all useful for different situations or different shooting styles and stuff like that. So say one of them's for out skating, one of them's for out filming like YouTube videos and stuff, and it is quite useful. And you set it to record to the clips right there, you can have a record it to the clips or not. Then you've got user clip name, no idea what that does, probably useful but I don't know. Then you've got initialize which basically just wipes all the metadata. Then you've got property which basically just shows you in a very clear way what metadata you are using just to make sure you're not using the wrong one. As you can see I've got my name in there in a couple of places, I've even got the name of uh, the location and the scenario and I've even got some notes on there as well which is quite useful. And this all shows up in Adobe when you're editing, it does show up and then exit out of that, and that's pretty much it. So in this chapter we're going to be talking about getting footage off of the HVX200 or the HPX or whatever you have, and getting it onto your computer and the kind of different ways you can do it. Now there are two main ways you can get the footage off. First way, which is via the USB 2.0 port or the Firewire port on the side. And your second option is buying a P2 card reader. Now, you have to go to Panasonic. I believe there is one third party company that do make a P2 card reader, but the P2 card readers, especially the USB 3.0 ones, can be upwards of three, 400 pounds. You can get USB 2.0 ones, which are a little bit slower, but you can get those at around about 100 pounds, sometimes a little bit cheaper, sometimes a bit more. Personally, I haven't found much use for them unless you've got three or four of these cameras and there's like a big operation going on, you'll probably want to look at getting a big like five card reader, P2 card reader. But if it's just you and you've only got one of these, which most people will, USB cable or a Firewire cable is completely okay. Those card readers are really quite expensive, especially for what they are. So you're better off just sticking to a bog standard USB cable. Now, if you're like me, I don't have Firewire on my computer, so for this video I will be demonstrating via the USB 2 port. But, principle's the same, if you plug it in via Firewire, it just shows up as a hard drive. So, there's that. So what you'll need for getting the footage across, if you're doing it via USB, is a USB Type 2B connection or something. Looks like that. I will include a photo and a correction, because I know I've got that wrong, probably. To a USB-A type connection. Um, if you've got a computer that only has like Thunderbolt or USB-C or something like that, you can get adapters and you know different cables and stuff like that, but it should still work. For Firewire, you're just gonna need a Firewire 4 pin to 6 pin, 8 pin or Thunderbolt or however it's gonna work for you, especially if you're on a Mac or something like that. Another very important thing you're gonna want, especially if you've got a lot of footage, is one of these, which is a dummy battery. For today's video, I will be running it off the battery, but I've only got one clip to move across just for demonstration purposes. But if you had like a whole day or two's worth of footage, get yourself one of these or be very mindful. Keep Make sure that you have a fully charged battery. It's one that you can rely on and keep an eye on the battery indicator whilst transferring. You don't want to be transferring a whole bunch of footage with a bunch of really good tricks or whatever it may be. And all of a sudden halfway through, battery dies and you've corrupted it. You know, it's not a good time. Another thing I also do recommend is getting yourself an external hard drive. Now, the DVC Pro HD files are quite big. It's 100 megabits in 720p 
50 or 60. So quite large files, you're going to want some space, especially if you're going to be archiving this stuff and holding onto it like I do. Now, before we start transferring, you're going to want to make sure that your camera is set up to transfer the footage across. Now, please excuse the next minute or so because I will be shooting it on my phone. Not very professional, but it will get the job done. Let's sync that up. That's probably synced. So what you're going to do is turn your camera on, go to your menu, go down to other functions and look for PC mode. Now there you'll have USB device, 1394 device or 1394 host. Now if you're doing it by USB, you hit USB. If you're doing it over the Firewire, you go for the 1394. And 1394 host is if you're using like an FS100 or something like that. So pop it in USB device and there you go, you're all good to go. So now that you have your camera set up, you're going to want to turn it off, get your USB cable and get everything hooked up. Get that one there. Wait for the fucking bike to pass, because everyone around here is a fucking di Right, now that's plugged in. Once your camera's turned on, you're going to hit the playback button. Wait a couple of seconds, and then hold the button down until it goes into PC mode. And you'll see it says USB device connected. And then all of a sudden, your P2 cards pop up. So from here, you can see the contents of the P2 card. As you can see, uh, P2, well, removable disk E is actually what's got the footage on it. So I'm just going to disconnect card F, or USB drive F, just to make things a bit simpler for myself. So now, my P2 card is right there with my footage on it. And as you can see, there's my clip that I filmed earlier. And there you go. Simple as that. So once you've got your P2 card showing up, don't touch any of this stuff. Don't go into it and start dragging things individually. Highlight last clip and contents and drag it into the folder, wherever your footage may be going to. Wait for it to do its thing. And there you go. Video's there. and the four channels of sound. Piece of piss. And then once you're done, click down here, removable disk E or whatever it may show up as, just, you know, find the P2 card, hit eject, and there you go. Then you can turn your camera off. Just like that. Super simple. Okay, so once you've got your footage onto your computer, do not touch it, okay? I know a lot of people, and even I, made the mistake of, oh, maybe if I drag this video file into my other folder and then go back and drag the audio with it, it'll be fine. Don't do it. There's no point of doing it. It's just going to cause a lot of heartache and a lot of complication, which you do not need. Trust me, it's not worth it. One of the first videos I actually shot with one of these cameras had no sound because I thought, oh, Oh, the sound on my computer must be not working, but here's the video, it must be there. Mm-mm, wasn't there. I'd accidentally deleted all the audio, so I was quite stupid. It's very easy to look at it and think, oh, what's all this shit? I don't need what? Proxy? What's the nothing in it? Voice? Don't need it. This right here is the heart of DVC Pro HD and the MXF file format. All of this is all connected, and when you bring it into Premiere Pro, Final Cut, whatever it may be, it will bring the audio with it, it will bring the thumbnail, bring everything that is attached to those files via the metadata, via the file format, it will bring it all along. So there's no reason to touch any of this stuff. It's all there exactly the way it's supposed to. Don't touch it. So if you're shooting a relatively big project and you've got multiple cameras or multiple cards, I find it quite useful to set things up like this. Say this bit of footage right here is the first card in the camera. So I'd call that card A, and then I'd drag everything into that. So I had a second camera with a bunch of footage on it as well. That could be card, card B, and then all the footage would go into there. This just keeps things a lot more simple. It's a good way of organizing things, and that's how I've been doing it as well. Now, another way you could do it, which I actually did for old Diva, was list things as reels. So every day would be a reel. So, say I'd shot some footage today and I was gonna go out tomorrow and shoot some more. I would make a folder called reel one. 
all the footage would go into it. Card A, card B, card C, card D, however many cards were, reel one would have all that footage on, all organised. Then, next day, maybe only shot a few bits and pieces, I'd still have a reel two and have all that footage in there as well. This was quite a nice way, I found it quite useful to organise the different days and stuff and when I'd go into the edit I would have sequences set up with the different names like reel one, reel two, with all the footage on it and bits and bits of b-roll that I might want and I could go back to it and oh I forgot about that clip and then throw it in. That was quite useful, it worked quite well. So you could do it this way, but there might be a way that you find better or whatever. And if you do find something better, feel free to leave the um, what well, the way you do it in the comments below, because I'm sure someone might think that's a better way of doing it. Now, I will mention a bit of software that Panasonic gives out for free, which is called P2 Viewer Plus. Now, not to be mistaken with P2 Viewer, which is the older version and isn't as good. With this, you can go in and see all your footage and it plays it back quite nicely. If you were to just go in and click on video, you won't get any sound, it's just playing the video portion of it. But if you want to play back your video with sound and information, you can go into your local folder or wherever your footage is being held, probably at Ransom, find the folder, which is here, there you can see your clip, and then in there you've got sound playback and you can jump around and you've got information about the clip. And the nice thing is, you can see the metadata. Now, metadata is simply just a bunch of information that you've put onto the camera prior to filming anything. So when you go back in the edit and look at all this footage, you can see, oh, this is who shot it, this is where it is, who's in it, location, wherever it may be, you can put it as metadata. So if you know, okay, so tomorrow I'm going to a major city or something, you can go on your computer, set a bunch of metadata. This is where I will be, this is who I'm filming with, and all that kind of information. So when you go back in the future, or even just whilst you're editing, it's like, oh, where was that footage shot in New Jersey? Maybe you've shot in New Jersey, wherever it may be. You can go in and look at all your P2 cards and type in New Jersey, and it will show you all the clips with metadata with the words New Jersey in them. So that's quite useful if you want to be quite anal with your file for like file organization and stuff like that. I like using it because it makes me feel professional. So as you can see, I've got my name in there. It's got uh, some program names. So I've put YouTube tutorials, music videos, and other stuff like that. And it's got a bunch of other information as well. See, here's my memo. Use when shooting for my YouTube or things outside of skateboarding, which this is. So I think it's quite useful personally. Um, and it's even just good to like go in and you can go into metadata editing, and you can go in and manually adjust the name of each clip. Say this is like a bale, or this is a land, or a bit of a sketchy one. You can click on the clip, hit E, or metadata editing, and then you can go in and say, okay, this one wasn't very good, and then you can find the good one, and then type that in. So when you get into Premiere Pro, or whatever it may be that you're using to edit, you can go in, look at that metadata, and say, ah, there's the land, so you're not sifting through all the footage. It's very, very, very useful. If you know how to use it and you take the time to kind of get into it a little bit and learn how to use it and all that kind of stuff, it is so nice to use. It does make things quite nice. You don't have to use it, it's not mandatory. You can just chuck all your footage on there, get onto the editing software and just do it that way. You can do it that way if you really want to. I personally prefer this method. It's a, it takes a little bit of time to get used to, but once you get used to it, it is a fucking lifesaver. It's really nice. I do like doing it this way. So if you've got an SD card that's compatible with the H3X and the HPX, you can input your own metadata. Now I won't go too in depth about this, but as you can see, you've got metadata name, user clip, name, creator, and all that kind of stuff. This is where you type all that information in. Now you can have, I believe, up to four, four or five different uh, metadata files. So you could have one for, say you film for a local shop or something like that. You could have, okay, so this is gonna be footage for so-and-so. And then one day, like, oh, I'm just going to film like a little web edit with my friends. You could have a scene for uh, a user file for that. And then maybe another day, it's like, oh, fuck, um, America's coming and I'm showing them around and they want the footage that I'm filming for their project. So you could have a user file for that or a metadata file for that. All just little things like that. And 
at the end of the day, if you're handing off your footage to someone else to edit, shit like this will put you a league higher than the fucking amateurs. Just saying. It'll make life easier for them, they'll probably want to come back to you, and maybe even pay you. Not, rec not guaranteed or anything, but they might want to pay you. So now that you've got your footage onto your computer, let's start editing it. Now, first thing I should just mention, although I am using Premiere Pro, pretty much everything I'm going to be telling you will translate to like Final Cut Pro, Sony Vegas, DaVinci, stuff like that. So if there's something in here like, oh, I don't think I can do that, you probably will be able to. It's pretty universal at this point. So I'm going to create a new project. Right, so now you have your editing software open, or in my case, Premiere Pro. Let's get some footage in. So straight away, I'm going to make some bins. So I'm going to have my A roll, B roll, sequence, full uh, bin. I have music bin as well. And then, say, if you're doing a sh video for a shop, logos. So there you go. You've got all your bins ready. Now let's get the footage in. Go to where your footage is. One's there. Can't pay video. Now you don't have to go in and manually bring in the audio, the thumbnail and the video and all that stuff. As I mentioned before, DVC Pro HD, the MXF file format, links everything together and it just brings it in. As you can see, I mean you can't really hear it, but there is sound so it's brought everything in as it's supposed to. So I can go in, if I really wanted to, and name this. So let's say, let's call this shot of HPX and screen. Now this doesn't adjust the actual name of the file, all it's doing is just adjusting the name on the screen. So that when you go through your footage you say, like, okay, that's that, that's that. It's just something to bear in mind. So once you've done that, drag it into whichever folder it belongs to. In this case it's going to be a roll. Now, most important bit coming up right now. Right, so you've got all your footage into your editing software. Now let's create a sequence. Now straight away, one thing I would just advise against doing is just dragging it in and doing that. It's not a good idea. Let's get rid of that sequence and create a proper one. Go in, new item, sequence, or however you do it on your software. Now straight away, as you can see, we've got all these options. Most people, and understandably, would think DVC Pro HD and then 72050, 72060, or whatever you shot at. No. This is something that even professionals have got wrong. If you use the preset DVC Pro HD sequence preset in Premiere Pro, whatever it may be, you will get mono sound. You'll get stereo music, absolutely no problem. But if you put skate footage in there or any footage shot on these cameras, it will come out as mono. The way I found is easiest is to actually create an AVCHD sequence and go for AVC HD 1080p 50, 1080p 60, whatever it may be. This will give you proper frame rate, proper resolution, and will also give you proper stereo sound. I cannot highlight that enough. If you do this with any of the other presets, you will get two mono channels straight in the center. But if you do it with the AVC HD preset, you'll get two, well, you'll get one stereo channel going left and right and center. You'll have the proper stereo surround. So do it like that. Don't use any of the other presets. Completely pointless. And from there, actually, you can create your own presets, as you can see that I have down here. So I've got 1080p, 16x9, 24p stereo. You can even see that I have stereo in capitals because of how happy I was when I figured out this little trick. I've got 50p, 60p, 4x350, 4x360. But if you haven't got a custom preset, Go with AVCHD 1080p 60. So this footage I shot it at was at 60p, so I'm going to go with that. Now one thing I will mention, just something that you should do, click on tracks, you'll notice 6, 5 and 4 are in 5.1 and then 1, 2 and 3 are in standard. Put those to standard so that when you bring your music in it will be proper, it's not going to be all over the place. There we go. Now you can save a preset if you'd like and that'll go down into your custom. Now, again, like I've said numerous times throughout this bloody video, all of these 
settings and whatever does apply to other software as well. It might be under different names or under different tabs and whatever, but you should be able to find it. You should be able to change it. So I'm gonna go with AVC HD 1080p 60, make sure all my channels are correct with standard, none of this 5.1 stuff. Let's call the sequence test, edit, edit over one, hit okay. And there we go. Drag that into my sequence bin. Now let's get the footage onto the timeline. Keep existing settings. There we go. Now straight away you'll notice that the footage isn't fitting the screen. All you need to do is set to frame size and there you go. And you'll also notice that the sound on the side, the audio meters, are working together and there is stereo separation. It's not very good because it's just me pointing at the camera but you can see that there is a bit of difference. There is a bit of left and right going on. If I had brought that in using the DVC Pro HD sequence settings, it would have come out as two mono channels straight down the center. And there you go, you're all good to go and you can start editing your footage. The audio in this section is gonna be a little bit different due to the fact that my lapel mic died. So you've edited together your little skate video, you've put everything at 10%, you've put your mate indie metal electro folk band music underneath, and you've put a logo in there somewhere, inevitably. Let's export that video, and I'm going to talk to you about resolution, bitrate, and all that kind of stuff. Now I'm going to put my head up on the screen for this, so please excuse that. So a lot of people, when they get to this section, they'll just chuck it at 720p, and just forget about it, which, honestly, we've got to stop doing that. 720p is highly compressed on YouTube and it isn't even recognised as HD anymore. Thrash is a big culprit of this, but near enough all of their web videos are uploaded at 720p. They look awful. Lots of compression, lots of mushy backgrounds and stuff, it just looks terrible. I would say the bare minimum for this footage, for these cameras, is 1080p 50 or 1080p 60. Anything below that and it looks terrible. Now, I personally like uploading my videos in resolutions above 1080, sometimes 2K, sometimes 4K. The reason behind this is because resolutions above 1080 get more bandwidth. So 2K gets more bandwidth, 4K gets more bandwidth, and so on and so forth. So uploading at 4K 50 or 4K 60, you get a shit ton of bandwidth. There's very little compression there so your video quality looks as good as it can be online. Now obviously this isn't gonna work for everyone, the file sizes can be quite big, pretty big, like the recommended spec or the recommended bitrate for rendering at 4K 50 or 4K 60, somewhere between 68 megabytes and 100 megabytes per second. 100 megabits, I should say. So the file sizes can get quite large. So if you don't have the hard drive space or your computer's not fast enough or your internet's not fast enough to upload it, 1080p is fine. Again, bare minimum. Just please don't upload it in 720. So I'm going to show you my custom export settings, okay? So we've got 4K, 4x3, so if I'm doing 4x3 filming with the fisheye and all that stuff, these are my resolution and bit rates and stuff. So I export at 2880x2160, which is 4x3, 4K. Uh, the frame rate might change depending if I'm shooting 50 or 60 or whatever. My audio's at 320, 48 kilohertz, stereo. Now if I'm doing it in 4K 60p, I've got a preset here, which is 3840 by 2160 at 60 frames per second. Constant bit rate, 68 megabits per second. Variable bit rate and constant bit rate, there's a little bit of, there's a bit to talk about there. I personally stick with constant bitrate. Variable bitrate is good if you want to lower file size, which is completely fair enough, but the render times do go up. So if you've got kind of a, a mediocre laptop like me, I find constant bitrate works better. And not only that though, uh, constant bitrate keeps the quality the same throughout, whilst variable bitrate, when there's a lot of motion, will reduce the bitrate and 
all this kind of stuff. So experiment with it, play around with it a little bit. I know some people prefer variable, I prefer constant, but again, it's just down to taste. So I have mine at constant at 68, but sometimes, you know, I might think, you know, this video is not too important or it's only a little one, so I'll maybe bump up the bit rate or something like that. If it's a particularly long video or something like that, I'll bring the bit rate down. I might bring it down to something like, say, 45, maybe. Uh, sometimes 50, you know, it does fluctuate and it does depend on the video. If it's quite a short one, bit rate goes up. If it's a long video, bit rate comes down. Simple as that. So using my settings, you've got 4K, 60p, blah blah, 68 megabits per second. You get a pretty large file size, but if you drop down to 1080p 60, if you render out at 50 megabits per second, it's just going to be chopped off straight away. There's no point of exporting at that size. So if you drop it down to, say... 20, 22, around about that. Look at the file size now, you've got 567 megabytes. Compl a lot more manageable, and that's only for a three minute clip. Like I said, 1080p gets compressed more than 2K and 4K, so there's not much point of going above 30, I'd say. Anything above that is kind of pointless. Audio, uh, obviously, you want to keep it as high as possible. Again, YouTube utterly destroys the quality of audio, unfortunately. I think it compresses it down to like 168 kilobits per second or something ridiculous. Which is a shame. I really wish YouTube would pay attention to uh, audio rather than video sometimes, but there we go. So in regards to format, I personally go with H.264. I know some people would prefer QuickTime and like a .mov, which is completely fair enough, but I'm on a Windows computer so H.264 works perfectly fine. If you need to export a raw clip, you know, with the sound and all that stuff to send off to someone else, maybe for a full length or something that they're editing, I would highly recommend working in Apple ProRes. ProRes! I'd highly recommend working with Apple ProRes. This is an uncompressed, super high quality like video codec. Um, you got 422HQ, LT, proxy, blah de blah. So if you need to send clips over to someone for a full length or whatever it may be, I'd highly recommend this. It puts all the sound together, you've got all that information, you've got all the colour information, and it's a lot simpler than sending over like the raw P2 folders, you know, with the contents, the audio and all that stuff. So uh, ProRes MXF files work pretty nice for that as well. Just thought I'd throw that in there just for anyone who might want to know. And that's pretty much it. You don't really need to touch many of these other things here. So yeah, just play around with it really. Just kind of figure out what works for you. You can use some of these presets, but sometimes they don't work too great. So set some up yourself, set them up for different scenarios like 4K 4x3, different frame rates, whatever it may be. Set it up and you'll be good to go. And then just hit export. Simple as that. Fucking hell. An hour and a half. An hour and a half you will never get back. In all seriousness though, if you've made it this far, thank you very much. You deserve a uh, cookie or a back massage. That'd be a good one. But yeah, if you've made it this far, thank you. I hope it's been informative and ever so slightly entertaining. Probably not, but you never know. That's it from me. Happy Christmas, or happy holidays, whatever you do. Um, and happy New Year. I won't see you now until January the whenever. Um, I've actually got a new series coming out. Uh, January, insert date here. I don't fucking know. But until then, stay safe. Have, look, have a good holidays, all of you. And um, yeah, I'll see you around.